Thank you. Okay, you can go next. Okay, and uh, Amber and myself, uh, we put together a uh, icebreaker for you. So as a reminder, if you can put in your comments in the chat, um, again, whoever is first with the correct answer, uh, we will have announced winners at the end uh, of this meeting, but uh, we hope that you enjoy our little slideshow that we put together for you. It's uh, it's just some fun that we put together for you, and it's regarding springtime. Okay, go ahead and go next. All right, the first question, what is the date of the first day of spring in 2024? Anyone? Okay, uh, we do not have any answers. We'll give it five more seconds. Okay, we have March 21st, that's uh, March 20th, and uh, March 20th again, and March 19th. Okay, can you go next, please? The answer is. And the answer is, go ahead and go next. I'm not sure if I'm the only one who can't see it or. Is anyone, uh, does anyone see it? No, you can't see the answer either? Okay. Uh, Tiana, can you go ahead and click next? Oh, it looks like it must have froze up. That's okay, that happens. Uh, actually, it looks like her system must have froze up. Rachel, I'm going to go ahead and pull it up if she doesn't come back in a couple of minutes. Yeah, just give her a few minutes. Yeah. I understand all about issues. Okay, and here comes the answer. All right, it was March 19th, and it looks like that uh, for the past century, the equinox has typically taken place on March 20th and 21st, which some of you did uh, say. Um, however, in 2024, the equinox occurred on March 19th, thanks to the leap year. Next. What animal predicts more winter or early spring? Christina came in with the groundhog. Okay, and let's go with the answer. And it is the groundhog. Next. And I'll turn it over to um, Amber. Okay, in which country do cherry blossom trees signify the beginning of spring? I think I just fell like a god. Dina. We got one answer at China and two at Japan, one in Washington. Okay, answer. K. 
Okay, Japan. The answer. Christina. Okay, next one. What is the main spring allergy trigger? Okay, we have pollen, pollen, pollen. Okay. The answer is pollen. Okay, next question. What is the most popular Easter parade or where is the most popular Easter parade held each year? Okay, we got Washington, D.C., New York, New York, New York. And the answer is New York. Next. April 22nd, 2024 was Earth Day. What are the three R's of recycle? Looks like we stumped a few people. Okay, we got re, re, I think reuse, reduce, and recycle. Reduce, reuse, don't know the last one. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Okay, so go ahead. Awesome. Okay, and go next. And thank you for participating, everyone who, who uh, participated. We do appreciate it very much. We will announce the winners at the end of this meeting. Thank you. And next. And I'll turn it over to Rachel. Good morning, everybody. Let me move my screen my uh, screen to another section here first, so that I can see it in a, a bigger format. So, okay. Yeah, it's Ed Bennett. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. Uh, today we're going to be going over. I'm going to be going over the Olmstead and uh, updates of what Access is doing. Um, to implement um, the additional uh, requirements um, to, you know, to continue implementing some of the um, services and coordination as we move forward with Om the Olmstead project. So I'll be covering that and how it's going to affect policies or um, any of the exhibits in the policy. So I'll be going over that today. Next slide. So how many of you know what Olmstead is? I know um, we've been talking about it during the person-centered planning process as you we all were involved in that um, and developing it. But um, if, if people could just like do a thumbs up to let me know what your, um, your knowledge of Olmstead is and um, kind of some background information. If you, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but if you just show a raise of, a, a thumb raise that just letting me know that you're familiar with this. Okay. Nice, nice. Good to see. Good to see them. So before, for those of you who are not really familiar with it and just kind of been following along with the updates of PCSP, I know We've um, a lot of you case managers, supervisors were involved in developing that PCSP. So the PCSP was part of that. 
Um, so it, it it wasn't just something that the state implemented. It's not just something that we at Access it. You're going to start doing it this way. We want you to follow these compliance measures. It wasn't something that the state developed on its own. So for that reason, um, you know, there's different phases of the within the Olmstead project that Access is. Um, involved in to ensure that we're continuing to do that integration, integrating our members into the tribal community. There's no disparities. There's no um, discrepancies of any kind. We're, at, you know, we're making sure that our members are getting the services that they need in the most least restrictive setting. So uh, for those of you that didn't raise their hand, I'm going to go ahead and have Tiana play a really quick video of what Olmstead is and to help all of those that don't really know what it is or are not really familiar with it, kind of get an idea of, of what we're, we'll be talking about. Activists in the independent living movement organized to demand an end to segregation for Americans with disabilities who were denied basic rights like attending schools, holding jobs, or choosing homes. This led to a major milestone with the U.S. Supreme Court's Olmstead decision. Like Brown versus Board of Education, the decision that ended racial segregation in public schools, Olmstead affirmed the idea that nobody can be separated from society and denied the right to make decisions for themselves. But it wasn't always this way. For decades, Americans with disabilities were largely housed in facilities, like nursing homes, psychiatric hospitals, or in developmental disability institutions, where residents had to follow rules about things like when and what they could eat when they could go outside, and even who they were allowed to date or marry. Society had an institutional bias, leaving few alternatives for people with disabilities. Disability activists fought back by organizing. From the 1960s to the 80s, activists staged protests and demonstrations, cases moved through the courts, and new legislation was passed, expanding access to housing, education, employment, and health care. Finally, a sweeping civil rights bill known as the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1990. Despite this progress, there were still gaps. People with disabilities could still be institutionalized. Then, in 1999, the case of Olmstead versus Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson was brought before the Supreme Court. In the Olmstead decision, the court concluded that people with disabilities have a right to receive state-funded supports in the community, rather than in facilities, affirming the argument that had been made by advocates for decades. Having these choices isn't more expensive. In fact, it costs less. In 2009, the National Council on Disability found the annual cost of institutional care was more than community-based supports in every state. $188,000 per person in a facility versus only about $42,000 for comparable services in the community. Later, cases based on Olmstead pushed states to create plans to reduce their institutionalized populations. Yet, progress has been slow. According to the last U.S. Census in 2010, over 2 million people were housed in some kind of facility. But community living isn't just a preference. It's a civil right. That's the legacy of the Olmstead decision. You have the right to choose your community and the right to access supports you may need in your home rather than in a facility. For more information, contact the National Disability Rights Network at ndrn.org. Rachel, you're on mute if you're talking. Oh, sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, so now that we've seen this video and uh, many of you supervisors, you know, we, we do ask you to share this presentation with your team internally so that they can kind of, I'm pretty sure a lot of them have an idea of why uh, changes are happening. There are, are there's going to be continued changes throughout the years. I know since uh, this story began with Olmstead, the, the Olmstead case, it began with two women, Lois, uh, Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson, and they were both diagnosed with a, a mental um, health condition and intellectual disability, and uh, both voluntarily admitted to be 
voluntarily wanted to be admitted to a psychiatric unit in a state-run Georgia Regional Hospital. Um, but following through, making sure that both that they were remained confined in an institution each for several years after the initial treatment was concluded. But they filed a lawsuit under the Ameri Americans with Disability Act for release from the hospital. And this is where it all started. So then it, it spanned across to the long-term care disability, uh, long-term care plans. And that's where we're actually, uh, we have a plan put in place to slowly and make sure, and as you heard in the video, there's been a slow progress in this um, project. So it really is up to the state how we're incorporating it internally. We do have meetings um, that we speak about this and, the, and we make those decisions to see, okay, what can we implement next? Because we don't want to um, put the whole um, project you know, out to the tribes or out to the MCOs and say, okay, this is what you, you guys are going to be doing. We have to be part of that process along with um, buy-in from you all too of what's feasible, especially uh, with the tribal communities. That's why we had you involved in the PCSP. That's where you identify cultural differences, um, you know, us respecting the tribal community, um, also ensuring that we're um, uh, listening and hearing some of the barriers and challenges that you all had uh, during that phase with the person-centered planning. So that's what we have really been in involving you all in, and we will continue to do that, and you will continue to see updates. So some of the changes and updates related to uh, long-term care or even some of the current processes put in place right now, um, you know, we have to constantly remind our case managers that these are requirements. It's, you know, this is not something that, you know, you as a leader are implementing or at the state level, they're saying you have to do this because we feel like doing this. These all have gone through, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, it has been made a decision. So a lot of these decisions that are made within policies um, really does reflect those um, uh, changes that were happening and for the Disability Act. So, so go ahead to the next slide. Okay, as I mentioned before, um, states are required to provide community-based services for individuals with disability and who would otherwise be entitled to institutional services. And this is where we kind of really talk about, um, you know, with you all to um, see what is the least restrictive setting for the member, depending on the member's needs. So if you have a member um, that you feel like maybe they were in a facility for a while for a specific need, um, if they were in a skilled nursing facility to seek those um, um, nursing services, like for wound care, physical therapy, um, those kind of services. We don't want to keep the member there. Um, I know that the reviews are like six months, every six months, but we want to make sure you, um, as a program, you know, check on the member. Is the member okay? Is the member, you know, progressing? Are they healing? Or do they need that? Uh, do they need that continue uh, institutional services? And, you know, make sure that that is, you know, continue to be reviewed and giving those member a choice as you're going through the PCSP planning and, you know, having them uh, be allowed to make those decisions, be part of those decisions. We do have some members in certain facilities, I know, where um, they're refusing to move to another facility. Um, they're refusing to move somewhere else. So in that instance, we have to look at the member holistically. As you've seen, it, it's based on member's choice, right? But we also want to make sure that it's cost effective. We also want to make sure that the member is getting the care that is medically necessary for them in whatever setting that they are in, whether they're in a SNF, an institutional setting, or if they're in an HCBS setting, just making sure that, that the, the placement that you're currently putting that member is appropriate, meeting their needs, and making sure that it's uh, again, that it's medically necessary. And if you feel at some point um, you're reviewing a chart, they're reviewing a chart, and they feel like, you know what, the member has improved or the member has expressed that they want to go to a lower uh, a lower restricted setting, or if they want to 
um, go home, you know, explore those options, document it in the case file. And if it's not appropriate for them to do that right now, at least you're discussing it, allowing the member to um, express how they feel, how they feel about where they're living at, if they're happy with it, um, or if they want to move somewhere else. If it's not possible, then, um, you know, discuss those barriers. What are the barriers? You know, what what is the re what is the main reason why they're not able to uh, move to a lower restrictive setting and you know exploring those options and and helping them to make those decisions that's really really important uh, we don't want to just have our members uh, basically living in a skilled nursing facility if they no longer need that type or level of care you know I'll always making sure that they're available case managers are available to to assist these members and, and, you know, that way we all know that, you know, we're aligning with what the state requirements are and also giving those members a choice. Um, it really, that's really the main part of all of this is allowing members to make those choices and helping them, even the healthcare decision maker, help, you know, helping that healthcare decision maker to make those appropriate choices for the member. And that the member is in agreement. You know, it's really important that members are in agreement with with um, the plan that you all have in place. Uh, we recently had a member who has a behavioral health issue is in an assistant living facility. And I'm, I'm still doing my research on that. It does require a lot of research. Um, and that this particular member, uh, you know, has some behavioral health needs. You know, they want to stay in that assistant living facility. We can't say, no, you cannot stay there but we need to educate them and let them know we need to be cost effective, um, you know, what specific type of services um, does this member need, which means if a member has a behavioral health, um, you know, diagnosis or a behavioral health need, or they've expressed that they have that behavioral health need, uh, you know, the uh, case manager really needs to be involved in that quarterly behavioral health meeting with the, with the, uh, the BHP, that way um, they are aware of what changes are happening or what's working and what's not working and to be there and be available for that member if they choose to stay there, document risk, if there's any risk, you know, and letting them know that, you know, this is a risk. I'm not saying you can't have it, you know, but you're, you know, you're, you have these risks, we need to talk about it and we need to make sure that you're safe. I want to make sure that you're safe and that we both agree that you'll continue your, your treatments or you, you'll continue your outpatient services. You know, those kind of things that needs to be discussed. Any service that the member is getting, uh, we want to make sure that we have wraparound services for our member, but they have a choice um, to discuss, you know, and, and make those options. But if something is not possible or if they're putting themselves at risk, please make sure that you're documenting it and that they are part of their um, treatment plan as a whole, whether it's just receiving care in the home or if they're getting behavioral health services or acute care services, allowing them to express those concerns. So we know that we're, um, as a whole, we're following that the state requirement for the HCBS settings. Next slide. So access is Olmstead plan. You'll see that there's a link at the bottom if you want to get more information about the Olmstead plan. Um, it does really talk about, you know, uh, what areas that the state is focusing on. And these are some of the areas that we're focusing on right now. As I mentioned before, and I mentioned this quite a bit, is members' voice and choice. Um, we, you know, we need to make sure if they don't, I mean, I know sometimes members, they want to, they have one direct care agency, and then for some reason they don't like it, they go to another agency, and then they go to another agency. If it continues to happen month to month or they're having issues with uh, direct care agencies, a managed risk agreement needs to be in place because there could be a time that um, you know a provider might say, you know what, um, this is a risk, member is, um, you know, never home, or, um, you know, the member is not listening to the worker that's coming in, you know, they're trying to be um, 
they're trying to make sure that you know their home environment is safe and uh, they're just not getting along and it causes a lot of problems you know that needs to be um, discussed not as an accusatory way but more or less you know the more you switch from agency to agency there could be a point where we're running out of agency to service you i know in some areas that's not the case but in other areas that that it could be to where um there might be providers who doesn't want to risk their license to oversee someone we had a member who was moving from uh one end of arizona to the the east side of arizona to the west side of arizona then moving north she was moving everywhere and then we heard she was in another state and then could come right back no one really knew where exactly this member was living at and um, they would have to really track this member down to find out okay is the member okay and sometimes the reviews were late because of it and uh, finally um, we did have to let the agencies know that if you're going to oversee this member you really need to make sure that the EBV is implemented and make sure they have some sort of device so you know that the member is getting the services that they need or if they're going out of state or if they're going to another location they you really need to let them know and have a plan put in place to to address those issues of them moving around so you know where to go when the review is is due so that you can continue to provide timely services and coordinate that for the member so those kind of things because they have a voice because they have a choice they can choose to go from one agency or another or a provider but if it continues to happen over and over more frequently that's when a, a managed risk agreement needs to be completed because the case manager does wants to identify the risk so if there's ever any liability issues they can say we discussed this on this day uh due to the member you know constantly moving around or changing agencies um, you know that discussion is is being made with the member that way you're expressing that the choice you know i gave the member a choice i heard the member but the member we also discussed that they continue to switch agency so that way they're documenting on their end that they're covering all basis that they did allow the member to have choice and they are allowing the member to have choice but they're also um you know putting themselves at risk and we did discuss that and another one of the things is that the placement rates some of these apply to the um the managed care organization because we don't contract with anyone um at whoever is providing services to our members they they typically accept the fee for service rates so um that pretty much applies to the managed care but this does not mean that um providers should be refusing services to our members we had recently discussed that in the last quarterly meeting that members um, should you know receive service from any access register provider so if you do get a provider who tells you i don't contract with your long-term care plan let us know right away and you know reiterate to them that they did provide they did uh sign the provide the updated provider participation agreement and that they had accepted to accept the fee for service rates and that has all the provider participation agreements have been updated uh so they are aware once they updated if they read it through and signed off what they what they agreed to do with access they did say that they were going to accept the fee for service rate so um, they were not going to refuse services to fee for service members. So if you hear anything like that, please let us know. Rate should not be a reason why a member cannot receive the same service as an MCO um, all tax member does. So please let us know. Uh, we can report that to get it investigated. If you let us know who said it, you know who you contacted, what the phone number was, get the name of the person and the reason why. If it is because of rates and um you know let us know so that we can follow up with those providers um network adequacy, adequacy that's pretty much the same as what is really implemented more on the mco side um person centered planning is really the one that i wanted to um focus on there are going to be updates in the person centered planning uh to continue that um 
um, Olmstead project to make sure that we're pretty much involved in that. I believe that's on the next slide that I have. And discharge planning is on there, assertive community uh, treatment, uh, consumer run agencies. Those are um, um, agency, I believe that was self-directed care. That was part of the project. Some of these are already implemented and we're doing revisions and updates on that, the CFT. Uh, those have already been implemented, but there's always revision every year. The service delivery model has, the, the expansion has also been part of this, this plan and it continues. But these are some of the things that we're, we're continuing to, to focus on and ways to improve on the access side. Next slide. So these are the project updates, as I mentioned before, the strategy for, you'll see on the link on the previous slide, the link will take you to the Olmstead plan, the Access Olmstead plan, and you'll see the different strategies of um, how it impacts us. Uh, work, work groups are formed, and within the, those work groups, um, once it is formed, there's that discussion of what um, we're implementing internally, the discussion with the subject matter expert at access. Um, it is then uh, once it's been um, reviewed and the discussions have been made with the work group team, the subject matter expert, we put something together and then we propose it to the tribes and the managed care organization. They provide feedback, everything that we do here in order to um, implement a new requirement, a federal requirement, we always make sure that we follow our processes internally. Like I said, a, a work group is typically formed. Strategy seven is the one I really wanna emphasize on. On strategy four and five, um, that's still a work in progress. There's not really any updates to that, but for strategy seven, we. We've come a long ways with this, and that's the person-centered planning. Uh, the enhancement is another thing that they're they're wanting to enhance the um, different areas of that person-centered planning, and one of it is really to um, um, to update the uh, person-centered planning. Um, we're actually currently working on that right now, and the implementation date is to be determined. We typically, all policies we have it updated. Um, they're they're pretty much implemented on 10-1 of each year. So if the revision is completed by this year, uh, they will make those effective date 10-1 of 2024. But currently there are still revisions happening within uh, these policies and, and the exhibit. So hopefully, in the, it, I believe this one's going to be posted on 10-1 of 2020, uh, 2024. But as I said, we're still working on adding those uh, revisions to um, uh, that exhibit for um, person-centered planning. And one of the things that they really looked at was the member's choice of service and providers. You know, it, it's a really big deal where some where it has been known that members are not given a choice. We want to make sure that we're um, giving members a choice. And members' needs and progress towards personal goals and desired comments. I know that's been like a really big struggle for all of us um, as to what is a personal goal. We've heard, you know, some members cannot communicate. Um, I know that they have healthcare decision makers that help them and guide them, uh, assist the member. Um, there could be goals that could be implemented with that healthcare decision maker. If, we're probably going to do more trainings on this one for sure. I know that it has been a struggle for everyone across the board. And, and let me get through this slide, Nayana, and then I'll get to your question. And then verifications that PCSPs were reviewed with the member guardian and revised at least annually. Um, I know that the discussion has to be done every quarter for some of these members, um, but we do need to have those documented in the PCSP. I know it says annually, um, but it all depends on the member's um, placement. When it comes to the member's placement, we wanna make sure, I think if you care only um, is annually, but we wanna make sure that you're visiting the, the PCSP, you're reviewing it, making sure uh, to be in compliance that we're meeting the member's needs because the member's needs can change at any time. And, um, informal support can change. There are 
sometimes there's family dynamics involved and one member was one one family member was taking care of a member now they no longer want to somebody else comes in but we want to make sure that the members needs are being taken care of at all times and expressing those concerns during the reviews and the services including the type scope amount duration and frequency specified in the PCSP as well as verification of ser uh, service delivery. Um, I know you all are really good about following up on service delivery DMEs or uh, when there's an issue with a direct care agency, uh, you all are pretty good about um, updating um, those services or communicating with the provider. We do have some a little bit of concerns with the EVB when it comes to authorizing those services timely. Uh, these providers have, um, they have timeliness to follow to, uh, to submit their, um, to submit their uh, claims to access. They also have to up, update all of their um, service plan in the EVD, the Sendata system. If they're using the Sendata system, they need that information, the referrals in order to set up the EVD. So we all play a part in making sure that the members services are set up um, timely and if there's if they're not timely it does interfere with them to to um, verify that the service is happening at the uh, member level especially if they have an in-home caregiver if there's no prior authorization in the system it's really hard for them to track and verify that a service was delivered to that member so um, please continue to um, stress the importance of the case managers updating those um, the CA-165, the service plan, that way the uh, direct care agency or any provider can deliver services without delay because they can see the prior authorization in their provider portal uh, when, when you all are updating the services. So um, that's really important. As for now, as I mentioned, the PCSP is under revision and the implementation date is to be determined. And I, I'm hoping that it's going to be updated by 10 10-1 uh, of 2024. On our side, the updates for the Tribal Alltech Supervisory Audit, audit uh, tool, we will be updating that and we're anticipating to have that finalized by 7-1 of 2024. We'll probably um, present that at that quarter, the quarterly meeting after that. And you can start using it if you want to just to kind of fill it out and say, is this working? Is it you know, what are, because, you know, not everything is always perfect when you roll it out. So we want to give it at least about three months to um, to uh, use that tool. Um, it is a fee-for-service tool. So, you know, we want you to give you time to get familiarized with it. What are the requirements? We'll, we'll also provide training on it. That way we have about three months to kind of roll it out and, and utilize it. Um, before it really goes into effect. And this will be the audit tool, the supervisory audit tool. Um, it, it needs to be updated to include the PCSP information or the requirements on there. So we're working on that. Hopefully my team will get that done by 7-1 and then we'll start setting up trainings uh, to make sure that you all have an understanding. There's, it's not gonna be too much of a difference, but we wanna put a couple of questions in there uh, related to the PCSP. So um, hopefully that will be done by July 1st, but we'll continue to keep you updated on that. Um, as for the, on the fee-for-service side, we were asked, is there anything um, that will need to be updated um, related to Olmstead and, and the IGA? And I said, no, because um, our IGAs, it refers back to the AMPM policy of what the requirements are, what policies to follow. So uh, there will be no revision according to Olmstead on this one. Uh, we did include that in the most recent IGA that was signed in 2023 and towards the end of 2022. So um, PCSP was part of that um, update. So just letting you know that there will be no revision with the IGA. So please continue to have your, your case managers look and review AMPM policy as updates are happening. Um, please continue to. Um, ensure that they're they're familiar with it and they know what homestead plan is so it's you know we've heard in the past this is what access is requiring access wants to do this it's all it's not really just us these are federal requirements and 
is mainly for the well-being of these members and to ensure that we're not isolating or institutionalizing our members uh, when they could be integrated into the community and have access to those same services that we all do. Next slide. What happened here? Can you press enter again? Maybe it's sliding in. Oh, okay. This press enter, tell it does all the bullet points. So as I mentioned before in the previous presentations, um, and I will I, and I continue to, um, you know, it takes a lot of research when we're looking for an answer. There's a reason why our system will not accept certain things. Um, there's, we do have the AMPM policy, we have the PMMIS manuals, um, we, any updates that are made, any requirements that we educate on, or when my team is doing education, they typically, uh, in these quarterly meetings, anything that they bring to these quarterly meetings is just to remind your team and to let you all know, hey, you know what, we do need to follow these policies because these policies are aligning with the federal and state requirements. And, um, you know, as for the MCOs, they have um, their own manuals also on the fee-for-service side. We, we follow the AMPM policies. And 1620F is specifically for those special services that's really specific for, for tribal all tax. So uh, please remember that when you're going through um, helping your your team members, your case managers make decisions. Uh, please always remember to let them know that we have to follow these policies. These are part of our requirements. And sometimes those policies takes us to, you know, an Arizona Administrative Code, and there it really does detail what the requirements are. So uh, please just really just reiterate, constantly reiterate that to them that we have to align and abide by what is written in our AMPM policies. Uh, so I believe this is my next, my last slide. So um, Nayana, you had a question. Yes. Um, so going back to that, um, I was um, writing down some questions that I had. So one, I know that um, you were talking about the members' rights. So I got a call earlier this week from a family member saying that. Um, Access is starting to say that those individuals that live off the reservation cannot request for Navajo Nation. So she says, but my mom is um, primary Navajo speaking. How is this individual going to be able to do what they need to do for, um, for my mom when she becomes a member? That's her concern. I said, well, you're going to have to bring that up to access and let them be aware of that is what I told them. And so they're starting to do that. So I'm receiving, a, that was my first call. And then the second question is, so I found out on my visit to one of the facilities over the weekend when I was um, on travel to go meet my member out in um, Tucson. Um, I found out the social worker is uh, um, authorized rep for one of the members. Um, the family member is um, has a voice, and sh and she was saying that because her mom is primary Navajo speaking, this worker is not making the right decisions for her mom because she doesn't understand what is going on so when i got there i talked to the member and the member pretty much understood what i was talking about and she she did say that um she wanted her daughter as a family rep so i put i changed the emc i re, did an emcr to change the family rep for that now um she's the family is a little bit upset about the social worker being the family rep and not her and not being given the opportunity to do so. And I said, well, sometimes the facilities will do this on uh, the benefit of the member to get them onto Altex, but that can be changed. So um, she did say that um, she wants her mom to be brought home closer. So I said, well, I'll start working on that. So 
I was just kind of like trying to um, get the member to um, say what she needed to say. And she did say, I don't understand what they're talking about. Even though she graduated from high school, doesn't mean that they fully understand Navajo because, I mean, English, because there's some words that you she didn't understand that they were utilizing in English that she knew in Navajo. So um, she um, speaks pretty much Navajo ever since she um, got out of high school. So that's a problem. And I was saying, oh my gosh. So um, anyway, I just wanted to know how this, how that can help the family. There's a couple of things that you said off reservation and members are being transitioned to, I'm, I'm believing it's a managed care health plan, right? Um, so if they were on reservation, we know in policy, they were on reservation and they got approved um, for long-term care while they were on reservation. And then later on, maybe it could even be days later, um, they went into a facility. Um, because they were approved while they were on reservation, then they should be with the long-term care plan uh, for that um, tribe. But if they, um, so I guess it's a case-by-case -case situation here that we're talking about. So if the member was maybe, and the member was in a hospital, they were out with AIHP, right? They were in the hospital. Something happened, the member transitioned to, um, this is what it sounds like for this member. When they got approved, they were approved while they were in a skilled nursing facility. But prior to going to that skilled nursing facility, they were with AIHP, they were living on the reservation. So somebody just needs to um, get a hold of eligibility and let them know that the situation, whoever is speaking, I don't know if, if this um, member has a legal guardian or somebody that can speak on behalf of uh, the member um, to communicate that. I do know that the um, we were informed that there are past assessors that can speak the language um, or anybody, somebody from the eligibility, you can request that. And she can be, if she doesn't have any legal guardian or somebody that makes their her decisions for her, she can, um, she can pretty much have that person contact eligibility and say, I wanna be enrolled in this plan because I'm, I'm you know, whatever from whatever tribe, and they should be able to re-enroll that member into that plan. But it might take the help of you um, to help um, initiate that. So that would be something that we need to look at. There are cases, so that's the case if the member was on the reservation before they went to the SNP. So they should be enrolled with that tribe. Now, if you have a member who was living on the reservation and later on, decided to move into an apartment or maybe they got a house in in um you know in an urban setting and that member chose to go with an mco that's their choice but when we're looking at a member going into an hcbs setting their own home not an elf their own home living in the urban setting more than likely they're going to be transitioned into a managed care unless the member says no we don't want that we have one tribe who we really truly advocated for uh where um, the tribe was in the middle of the urban setting and eligibility kept moving them to the mco and the tribe kept saying no these members want to stay with our plan they just live like on the border border side of the um the tribal you know, area, they, they live right outside of that, not too far. And we advocate and we continue to advocate for those members to be enrolled with that tribal plan because they only speak the language or the tribal plan understands the culture. So we can advocate if there's an issue, if it is member choosing not to go with an MCO plan. If they're in an HCBS setting, we do need to do a lot of advocating. We need to justify why if they're, if they're living in a home out here in or in any urban setting, we need to justify why they want the tribal plan. They're in an HCBS setting, but they in their own home, but they want to stay with their tribal long-term care because they have a history with that case manager. 
they, the case manager understands the language, they understand the culture, they understand the needs for that member, and they can truly advocate for that member. We can work with, with um, you all on that to transition that member back to the tribal plan. So it, it just, it's a case by case. So I, um, I know that Frida is really familiar with how that works. So um, again, I know that there were some decisions made internally by the tribe also. Every tribe is different. So I think you would need to really work with your leadership to ask, um, is this what we're wanting to do? Because um, if the tribe is saying, you know, if they're in an HCBS setting, we want them to go with an MCO, uh, depending on whatever's going on within the tribe, that's really a decision that they would have to make. So that's how we can handle an HCBS setting. But if they're in an institutional setting or if they're in an ELF alternative setting, and if the member chooses to stay with that, that case manager from, from Navajo Nation, they have a right to choose that. But if they're in their own home, in, in their own home XCBS setting, in an urban setting, more than likely they, they would be transferred to uh, the managed care health plan unless the member speaks up and says, I don't want to be serviced by this case manager because they don't understand my language or my culture. They have a right. And it's good that you're working with the, the family to bring the member home, as we talked about the Olmstead. Um, you know, I really do like to hear that because a lot of our members um, do not, you know, um, they, they don't want to be away from home. You know, I personally can speak for that myself. I don't want, I never wanted to be in a boarding school, but it was against my choice. Do I want to go to a skilled nursing facility when I get old? No, because it's going to remind me of boarding school. I don't want... I want to be able to be free. I want to be able to walk in and out of my home. I want to be able to pray, do my morning prayers. I want to be able to eat my, you know, mutton stew when I want to eat it. I want to eat, you know, I want to eat my blue cornmeal mush. You know, I want to be able to put ashes in my blue cornmeal mush without somebody telling me, hey, that's not good for your health because that's part of my culture, you know. So the, so it's really good to hear that, you know, that um, you're, you're, um, doing you're going to do your best to try to get the member home so i hope that answered your question Nayana. it did thank next you slide. you're welcome next slide it, i think this is the last of my presentation thank you all Okay, and this kind of piggybacks on what we were just talking about. Um, uh, I will be presenting the PCCR and required documents. Next. And again, I'll be doing a brief overview of policy 1620M contract exchange standard, as well as the transfer process requirements and what documents are needed when initiating the process. The policy establishes requirements for transfer of the members between the MCO managed care organizations. And to read the policy in its entirety, the link is located below. Next. The member transfer process and requirements. Um, transfers between one MCO can occur for a variety of reasons. For example, the members moving out of one MCO's area to another, to, or maybe the member's representative has requested it. Per policy, the case manager is responsible for the discharge planning and transition of all members that are transferred to another MCO, along with initiating the request when made by the member, authorized rep, or guardian. The CM should not assume that a change in MCO is automatic and ensure that that is communicated to the member, authorized rep, or guardian. Tribal members are considered to have on-reservation status even when they are at a TNF with another MCO area of service. Next. Tribal members who move to their home or another HPBS setting off the reservation will be transferred to an MCO serving that area. CM shall discuss the potential transfer of a member with the Access Tribal All Text Coordinators of the potential MCO to make sure that the availability of services are in that area. CMs are responsible for explaining 
that there may be limitations, exclusions if the member moves into that MCO service area. Next. Once the member is determined to be eligible for the transfer, determining what MCO covers the member's identified area is next. Here's a list of the MCO ID numbers, um, as well as the current MCO coverage area map. This map will be updated around October and November of this year to reflect the updated MCOs and their coverage area. Next. And uh, we highly recommend that the case manager always go to the AM PM policy online to ensure that they have downloaded the most up to date form as the packet will be returned to the case manager for missing information if the current form is not used. This could delay the transfer process. These forms can be found under 1620, the all text case manager standard, and I've also included the links for these documents on the right side. Next. And so this is the PCR packet um, list of checklist of documents. Um, the first one is the PCR. It has three pages. Um, we ask that the first two pages be filled out, and the third one will be the um, the final form that we will send back once the MCO has um, completed whatever their outcome is. And then number two is the ETI form. Um, and that has a total of eight pages. And then we ask that the CM cover memo um, is attached that gives us an, an idea um, of what's going on with the member's health, why they want to change um, MCOs, where they're moving to, what kind of services they're receiving um, currently and by whom. Um, and then the most current uh, PCSP, the most current HNT, it's HBBS. And then the UAT case note, list of medication, and then the path assessment summary. And if by chance that member, you know, it's been several years, we can we can get one um, and submit it. Just let us know. Next. And then once the packet has all the list of documents on the checklist, the CM will then send the packet for us to review. And then once we have determined that the packet has all the needed documents, we'll then submit it to the MCO. Then the receiving MCO will then notify the tribal all text team within 10 business days of whether they've agreed to accept the member, maybe they need more information or have declined the transfer. In the event that the transfer is accepted, an enrollment date will be identified and the PPCR will be returned to the relinquishing MCO with that third page of the PPCR completed by the receiving MCO. Next. Thank you. Okay, next. Okay, so I am going to go over uh, the hospitalizations, um, the policy that is relating to this. Uh, since we went through the audit last year, uh, most of you uh, have, we identified at least one member uh, within your tribal program that had been hospitalized and a review had not been done uh, post-discharge within 10 business days. So it is in policy as that's what we're gonna go over today. And also the urgent emergent versus normal PA requests. So go ahead and go next. Okay, so the actual policy is uh, AMPM 1620E and the link is provided there. Um, the case managers are to conduct a, a post-discharge PCSP meeting within 10 business days following a member's discharge from an inpatient setting, or if they have a change in placement. For example, if they're going from an HCBS setting to an institutional setting or going back to their own home um, or assisted living, whatever the case may be. Um, and 
uh, whatever date that the case manager is made aware of this change. Uh, the PCSP meeting shall be conducted to ensure that the appropriate services are in place and that the member and the healthcare decision maker agree with the PCSP uh, as authorized. As we all know, once a member's been hospitalized, things can happen. They can um, have uh, additional services that are required, and that's the purpose of having a post discharge. However, if a member is in a uh, uh, inpatient, um, is discharged from inpatient hospital stay and they're returning back to the same uh, SNF that they were in prior to being admitted, then a post discharge uh, PCSP meeting is not required. That's the only time it's not required. Um, if a member is discharged from the hospital to a new SNF, uh, then again, uh, a PCSP meeting would be required within 10 business days. Uh, for members enrolled with a contractor during an inpatient stay in the hospital, uh, they're to conduct again a, a new review on site uh, within 10 business days post discharge. And uh, this is just to ensure that all the needs are met for the member and that uh, whatever services they need, if they need additional services, that those are provided. Next slide. So uh, we have noticed uh, that some of your members, um, various tribal programs, um, are hospitalized sometimes several times a month. Um, and this is unfortunate, but it does happen, unfortunately, and that may require more frequent monitoring. And if that's the case, if a member is hospitalized multiple times within a month, then uh, possibly the case manager needs to speak with the provider about PAing services on a weekly basis versus a monthly basis. Uh, to avoid having to open up that line repeatedly throughout the month that maybe they would only uh, have to open up a, a one part of, you know, one week or whatever the case may be uh, to be able to enter in that A23 on the CA165 screen. Um, that doesn't happen that often, but, you know, we offer that out there is that if a member is hospitalized frequently, that may be something you need to consider. Uh, next slide. So we want to talk about urgent and emergent versus normal PA requests. So again, in AMPM 1620E is where this um, policy is, and it talks about the urgent and emergence. It's basically that it cannot safely wait for a timely PA request to be submitted and approved due to a life-threatening situation. That would be an urgent and emergent uh, type of request. A non-emergent request where it can wait, uh, safely wait for a short amount of time um, for the PA request to be submitted and approved. Um, according to policy, they're to take action when they identify or have an have been notified of an urgent or potential emergent uh, situation. Um, this is something that they should uh, be communicating with their supervisor or manager to determine the level of intervention and appropriate action. And uh, again, more frequent monitoring may be required if um, an urgent emergent need uh, is identified or the member's condition has changed whatever the situation is, uh, those are uh, things to make sure that we do not have um, the member's health or safety is put at risk. So just keep those things in mind. What's the difference between urgent and emergent versus non-emergent? Uh, next. Okay, so again, um, we have noticed, uh, the clinical team especially has noticed that um, sometimes we get requests saying this is urgent, this uh, is urgent, it needs to be done right now. Well, if a member or if a case manager, excuse me, forgets to submit a timely PA request for a member, that 
case manager may consider that an urgent request, but that is not a life threatening necessarily. Um, if it is life threatening, then of course that would be considered an emergent uh, urgent request. But forgetting to submit one just you know it's not going to be urgent that will be the normal process um to uh, be processed within the standard 14 calendar days however if a member's medical condition is life-threatening and the pa request is urgent to ensure the member's life is not put in danger that indeed would be considered an urgent or emergent request uh, the program manager or supervisor should alert access in advance then emergency PA request is being submitted by the case manager and explain the life-threatening medical condition of the member. This type of PA request will take precedence over normal PA requests. Uh, but again, that needs to be communicated to us in advance. Next. And that's all I have. Is there any questions? If not, we are running behind uh, quite a bit. So. I don't want to take up too much more time. Okay, go ahead and go next. Hey everybody, my name is Natalie. I'm the new Altex nurse, and I will be presenting on the ALF and SNF specialty rates, as well as home modification and DME retro authorization requests, and Vanessa will be speaking on AAC requests, acute care services, and faxes. So I will turn it over to Vanessa to speak about the AAC requests. Next slide. Hi, everybody. So for uh, AAC authorizations, we did go over this briefly in our uh, previous um, quarterly meeting, so I'm just going to go over it again as a refresher. Um, there are different types of AAC. There are low-tech devices, uh, no-tech devices, and high-tech devices. Um, there's just some images as to what types of devices are out there for our members um, and what the differences are. Um, next slide. Uh, for the AAC process, um, the PCP will write a script for an AAC eval. The eval will go to the tribal case manager. Um, I did list the speech eval code that will need prior authorization requests for. Um, the case manager will submit for authorization for the speech eval. Um, and once authorization is issued, the case manager uh, will work with the AAC referral or the member to um, complete the AAC referral and intake packet, um, and they'll get that over to the AAC agency to schedule the eval. Um, the AAC evaluators will um, meet with the member, do their evaluation, decide which um, AAC um, is most appropriate for the member. Um, at that point, the case manager will work with the DME company to submit for prior authorization for the DME that best meets the member's needs. Um, the DME agency will you know, render services to the member um, and the member will get the device. Um, once the member gets the device, there is another code or a procedure code that the member would be able to get prior authorization for. It does need to be listed on the script for the AAC, and that's for training the device. Um, and that HICPIC code is also listed, uh, the 92609. Um, next slide. For the required documents, uh, AAC evaluation, um, the AAC evals and descript from the PCP. Uh, the script should say um, evaluation for AAC or evaluation for augmentative communication device and therapy treatment. Um, they will need a face to face within the last six months. Um, for the AAC DME request, they will need a script with the certificate of medical necessity signed by this PCP the AAC evaluation and the provider quote. 
Um, the DME providers will need to bill Medicare when Medicare is primary. Um, a valid EOB or denial will be needed if the member is Medicare primary. Um, next slide. For the acute care service um, request process, uh, we still are getting uh, providers that are reaching out to case managers, um, and we're continuing to work on this. So for the acute care service provider types, um, we do have a listing of what are all uh, acute care services. Um, the Acute care service prior authorization requests need to be sent to the DFSM fax number, um, and those will be submitted directly from the provider. The case manager does not authorize these requests. Um, once the provider faxes them over to the DFSM team, the DFSS team, the DFSS team will review the PA request and enter the authorization into PMIS. The provider will get a response um, on the provider web portal or via fax, and the provider will need to log into their web portal for PA determination. Uh, the tribal case managers will not receive notification of statuses for the acute care service request. Um, and in the event a provider reaches out to you um, requesting your assistance or um, PA for these types of services, you can forward them over to us so that we can get in contact with the FSM. Um, and then if you guys can get us, you know, the contacts of who misinforming the providers, that would also be helpful. Um, there have been some um, acute care service requests where the providers were wanting the case managers to submit for prior authorization, um, the treating provider would need to submit for prior authorization uh, via fax. Um, there has been some confusion with the case manager submitting for the prior authorization. Um, with the case manager submitting, there are times where the case manager ID um, is listed as the provider ID and that has caused some confusion um, with the submission. Um, so if we can, you know, just get the providers to submit for their prior authorizations or get us the contacts for who is um, providing this communication. Next slide. Uh, again, this is just uh, the acute care service uh, contacts. So for acute care services, they'll get faxed over to the 602-256-6591 fax number. Um, and if a provider is misinformed, if you could get us their name um, so that we can get that corrected. I see Tuba City's hand is raised. Oh yeah, good morning. Uh, this is Casey uh, from Tuba City. Um, I had a question about that. Um, when you mentioned the web portal, uh, I, I believe most like providers, um, if they are familiar with access and just how to do like prior authorizations and stuff, they kind of are on top of that and where to get the training and stuff. But once in a while, um, I think if they're a new employee to that, uh, either like nursing home or DME provider or whatever, sometimes they kind of like um, ask for um, like training. And I usually refer them to the access website to, to, to or, or their, or, or ask their administration to, to help them with that. Um, and that's um, where you guys, we can refer those calls to you to also, right? or to PA unit to, to have them link up to the proper like training to get the proper process to get prior authorizations and how to use the web portal and check the web portal and how it kind of interfaces with our PMIS authorization, right? Yes, that would be helpful. Um, 
we can direct the provider training to reach out to these providers that need additional training. Um, typically, the provider training, you know, they they would need their contact information, okay. whether it's email, phone number, um, and just you know their name as to who is in need of the provider training. Okay. Um, and then uh, Connie did drop the email for provider training chat the providers can also email this email address uh, provider training ffs at azaccess.gov and they can request training directly from the provider training okay thank you mm -hmm. um when we revise that well before sending this um presentation out can we go ahead and add that provider training um, link to this slide? That way, if they're if the programs are using this to train their their uh, case manager, the information will be available right there. So they can the case managers can just review this and know where they have to send it to if they get a call from a provider. Uh, we can add it to this slide. Uh, there is another slide further in our presentation that also has the information for provider training and claim. Uh, next slide. Okay, so for receipt and imaging faxes, um, if anyone is uh, faxing, these faxes do have a 72 hour turnaround time. Um, we uh, have had a decrease in faxes just because of, you know, the TIPCO process has gone into effect. But if anybody has to go back to a, a fax uh, for any reason, uh, just keep in mind there is a 72 hour uh, turnaround for those faxes. Next slide. Uh, home modification, Natalie. So just to provide you with the policy for home modifications, it is AMPM 1240I. Um, access covers physical modifications to the home as determined through an assessment of the member's needs and as identified in the member's service plan. Home modifications shall have a specific adaptive purpose aimed at increasing the member's ability to function with greater independence in his or her own home, thus reducing the risk of institutionalization. Next slide. So we did want to ask you all um, how many CMs have a work smartphone or a phone with a camera. Um, if you can provide us with insight on that in the chat. Next slide. The reason we are asking is because we are seeing requests come in that uh, members do have existing accommodations. Commonly, we're seeing ramps, walk-in showers, or roll-in showers. And we are not um, seeing these accommodations until we receive the bid photos from contractors. So if a replacement is needed of an existing accommodation, we will need explanation for the replacement and photos at the time of the home mod request. Um, this will also be needing to be included in the PCSP and the reasoning for replacement. Next slide. Home modification ex exclusions. Um, examples of specific exclusions for the provision of home modifications include, but are not limited to, modifications of the home that are of general utility to the household or that are not of direct medical benefit to the member. Uh, general maintenance items, home improvements, or home repair. These are considered to be the responsibility of the homeowner and they are not covered by access. Next slide. Some examples are um, plumbing, not draining or clogged, septic tanks that are full or in need of repair, water heaters that are not working or need to be replaced. Um, these repairs would need to be completed prior to requesting. These items are not a benefit of the home modification. Next slide. Moving into specialty rates for the ALVES, um, we are increasing the additional documentation, we would like to see the PCSP behavioral health sections 
specifically pages 5, 6, 18, 19, and 28, in addition to the behavioral health progress notes from the provider, psych notes, and the behavioral health notes from the facility. Additionally, if a risk is identified by the clinical team, um, a managed risk agreement will be requested and needs to be on file prior to the um, approval. And I believe Sonny and Vanessa will be touching more on um, the managed risk agreement. An example is a member leaving the ALF to consume substances or leaving the ALF without supervision. Next slide. Similarly with the SNF um, specialty rates, we do require an admit packet for new or initial admit to a SNF. We do require the rest request form with the dates of service and specialty rate being requested and uh, the most recent provider notes. So usually within 30 days because um, they should be being seen by the provider in the SNF. And similarly with the ALF, if a risk is identified by the clinical team, such as a member refusing the specialty rate related service, then we will be requiring a managed risk agreement to be provided prior to the approval. Next slide. VME retro prior authorizations do require a proof of delivery, a delivery ticket for the date of service rendered and um, the specific dates of service being requested for retro. Next slide. I'll turn it over back to Vanessa. So for any claims questions, um, there is a claims number and I do have an email I can add to this slide before we send it out. And then there is the provider training slash resource, contact information and the email or uh, provider training um, to be reached out to directly. Next slide. And then um, if you do need to reach out to the clinical team, please refer to the uh, Tribal Alltech uh, general mailbox, um, include in the subject line uh, prior authorization and what um, prior authorization you are uh, reaching out for. And then the member's name, ID, provider name, provider ID, and any detailed information regarding the prior authorization. Um, and the PA nursery specialist will look further into the PA inquiry. Um, and then just as a note, uh, please do not utilize this email to check the status of your PA request. Uh, check CA-165 submission of request. Um, short notice does not constitute an urgent request. An urgent request or expedited request can take up to three days to review. Um, requests submitted as urgent that are determined to be routine in nature will be processed in accordance to the standard time frame. Next slide. Uh, awesome. I think we caught up on our time. Thank you, everyone, for being brief. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. So everyone, if you need to go get a drink or go take a bathroom break, let's meet back here at 1040.
Okay, it is 1040 and we are back. And if you want to go ahead and go next. All right, we'll turn it over to Rachel and Tiana. Okay, so we're going to jump into the TIBCO reminders and we'll just be going over TIBCO and just some housekeeping on what to remember whenever you're submitting documents. So we'll go over the purpose of TIBCO. So we've made the transition to the TIBCO um, early, actually last week. So all the health plans have moved over to TIBCO and they're all sending their documents in through the system. So I know that change can be hard and it can be challenging um, or kind of scary to change over to new systems. But the reason why we've made this transition is to provide a faster and more efficient way when submitting PA requests or the documentation. And also reduce the number of duplicate submissions. And there has been some fax issues in the past, so we want to eliminate that issue. Um, eliminating any documents being cut off or not receiving the full fax whenever it comes in. And also the faxes being eligible whenever we're reading them. So we've received a lot of submissions through TIBCO, um, which is great. So that just means the system is working. And with that, we've noticed that the documents are coming in faster and then they are also more readable and legible whenever we're going through the process. So just a reminder that TIBCO has three parts. So the first part is uploading your attachment, so the PA requests. Um, the second part is inputting all the details for your health plan, the program, the Tribal Altex health plan, and then also the member's information. And then once all that looks correct, then you'll go ahead and submit the attachment from there. Um, some key reminders whenever you are submitting, the address section should be only the health plan address. So your address, not any member's address in there. And then for the patient last name, that should only be the member's information. So with TIBCO, we don't need any case manager information, so you don't need to be inputting that in there in any of the sections. So it's all member's information. Uh, as a reminder, do allow 24 hours to see an update on PMIS CA165 screen to see if a submission was received. And usually we're pretty good about adding in our comments into the CA165. So just refer to that if you feel like you, you haven't noticed any um, approval or denial letters. So just refer back to the CA165. And then whenever you do, whenever you are logging on and off and signing back into the TI portal, the last data entry details are saved. So just be mindful of that. Make sure you're double checking your submission, making sure that the member's information is correct, the address is correct, and then that payer claim control number is correct as well. So whenever you are uploading an attachment, um, just be mindful that make sure all the PA required docs are merged into one PDF file. So unfortunately, we can't add multiple files during one session. So that's why we want you all to have it in one combined and merged document. And that includes the fax cover sheet. So make sure that you are still including the fax cover sheet and all the required documents with that whenever you merge them together. Um, if you do try to add multiple files at once, it'll just kick out the previous file and not add all of them together. So that's why we really want them all into one combined document. And then, as always, once um, your document is successfully uploaded, then you'll get the message stating successfully uploaded file and then the file name. As for the payer claim and control number, so whenever you're entering the member's details, this is one of the last inputs you, you insert. And it's really important to have this formatting correctly um, to reduce the risk of it being misfiled or having a delay in process or approval. 
And the correct formatting is T all text, prior auth, your health plan ID, and types of service. So with the health plan ID, this ensures that we know that it's your health plan submitting the PA request. And then with the type of service, um, it allows us to, um, to know what type of service it is. So if it's a DME request, a home modification, a SNP, a special, a special rate or an alpha behavioral health. So just make sure you're adding all of that input inputted and make sure it's um, formatted correctly. Um, it has come to our attention that some scanners do have page limit abil abilities. So with that, if you need to break up your documents and submit them into smaller sections, then whenever you're doing that, um, just label them as one of two or one of three or two of three, however many um, different breakupage you're going to do. So that'll be the same format though. So T all text prior auth, the health plan ID, the type of service, and then just that one of two at the end. Um, so that's all I had. Do anyone have any questions with the TIPCO process? So questions? I hope everybody likes the typical process because now I feel like um, um, it's going to give us more data on um, how we're receiving it and what's going on every year for that, like I mentioned before, for the past probably um, for as long as I could remember, going all the way back to 2015, I believe we've always had issues with facts. And we do monitor all the prior authorizations that come in. We put them in appended status. We do have uh, specific statuses that we label them as. If it's a duplicate a request, we're putting it as duplicate. Um, if it's missing information, we, we title it missing information. So every year annually, we do have to provide those numbers to our leadership and let them know, hey, this is what the issues are when we're getting these PA requests. So that that is the reason why we were heard internally and i know externally you all uh, some of you have really advocated for your your um, offices to say we're having issues here can you please um, update your process um, you know come up with a better process of submission besides facts because we're having a lot of difficulties uh, submitting and it's time consuming so we've really been doing our best to try to streamline this uh, process across the board. So the things that we uh, that we touched up on today, we are noticing that um, there's issues in those areas, in those forms, in the, in the actual um, forms of uh, the form actually itself. There are issues when there's um, documents that are not the documents really attachment. I think there was a one that had like a zip file that was added and it wouldn't allow it to do that. Um, so just be mindful of um, how you're attaching the documents and also reminding your staff to follow that standard format that was provided to you all during the training. And if someone has not completed a training and they're not comfortable with it, because as uh, Tiana had mentioned, some of us are not really um, tech savvy and it could be nerve, you know, nerve wracking to do something that's new. So please make sure that your team members understand before you start allowing them to submit documents, because I think we started getting some documents uh, from, from case managers that hadn't even taken the training uh, or were not part of the training, and uh, they were just submitting it and it was done incorrectly. So please uh, let, let ensure that your case managers are properly trained and you as leadership, uh, who were the subject matter expert who went through the training, please uh, retrain if you need to on your end. Go ahead, Diana. Okay, so it wasn't easy for me to get onto TIPCO. I had to do, um, I had to notify the service desk like about four times in order for me to get on. I finally got on, yay. Um, but I noticed that there, you guys are requesting for transport prior authorizations um, over 100 miles. So the case managers aren't able to authorize that no more, or what's the deal there? Okay. 
Where are you getting that from, Diana? Who, who are we getting that from? I just saw that on the slide before. It says oh. authorization, prior authorization for prior authorization for transport over 100 miles. So that's why I'm asking. So the case managers can authorize um, transportation and it has to go through you, you guys, before it's yeah. authorized? Yeah. It goes through the case manager. It goes through the, it should be going through the case manager. So we can probably go back to, can you go back to that slide? Can you go back one slide? Um, I believe these are for like um, specialty. We might need to correct that. Like say if um, if it, we've had issues where transportation, we'll remove the over 100 miles, but if it's a specialty transportation, like if a member was in another state and they needed maybe a uh, flight transport or something like that, I think that's what it was for. So we can remove that 100 miles. They can still authorize 100 miles. Okay, thank you. Thanks for noticing that, Diana. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead, uh, Casey. Oh yeah, this is Casey. Um, uh, just I guess more of a comment that um, this typical thing. Um, it's actually, um, I really. I think it's um, a good thing. I mean, it's a lot easier. Um, but they, uh, just today, I heard that we can send like one or three or something. Our office is one of those offices where scanners, um, they have limitations on the number of um, pages it will scan. So it's good to know that we can do multiple ones and kind of add a comment or addition one of one of three or whatever to that. So most definitely that will probably be most of our submittals with the larger packet. So we'll be processing those. That's it. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Byron, you raised your hand and then Lakeisha will get to you next. Byron? My my speakers are really bad and I don't think I don't know if you can hear me, but this is Byron. We can hear you. Okay, you're back on mute, uh, Byron. So if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, I was saying that my speakers and uh, the audio system's pretty bad. Okay, did you have a question regarding TIPCO? No, not necessarily. Uh, we just uh, I just now started to give it out to the uh, workers so they can get it, so they can get on. But with mine, I got on and everything's just set. I just need to uh, probably start using it. Okay, that's very good. Okay, Lakeisha, go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Just a quick question about TIPCO. Um, you may have went over this and I may have missed it, but if we upload something in error, is there a way to delete it or do we have to just re-upload the correct um, packet? So you would have to upload the correct packet, um, but if you do to have uploaded something in error, just let us know in the general mailbox and we can remove it from the queue. 
uh, whenever you do upload your current submission or the correct submission, uh, just let us know with that too within the general mailbox. Great, thank you. Okay, and Niana, go ahead again. Okay, um, so is the specialty rate uh, checklist going to be up, um, updated to include the additional new requests, requirements that the ELF behaviors need? <clears throat> Oops. Vanessa, you want to answer that? Uh, yes, we're going to have to go back and um, make some edits to that. Thank you, Nana. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We know this is a big uh, process and we know it's a big change. Uh, so this is your time to talk and we are we do have a few minutes. So if anybody has any other questions, please speak up. Go ahead. And if in the future anyone needs retraining, or if you ever have any questions or any concerns with TIBCO, uh, you can always reach out to me or through the general mailbox, and then we could either set up a time to go over training again to re-go through the process, um, or if you're having issues uploading documents or combining them into the PDF file, you can always reach out and then I can assist in any way that I can. Thank you, Tiana. Okay, so it doesn't look like anybody else has any other questions. Uh, just so you know that in the chat, uh, we one of the questions the clinical team did ask is whether or not your case managers have smartphones. We do have two replies in there. If uh, you guys could reply in there for the clinical team so that they know whether or not your case managers have smartphones where they have the ability to take um, pictures that would be helpful just as a reminder. Okay, we'll go ahead and go next. Okay, we're going to, uh, Vanessa and I are going to talk about, and this was going to be a lot longer, but uh, it's actually a little bit shorter, so maybe we'll catch up on some of our time. Um, but we're going to talk about the behavioral health and specialty rate concerns. Um, Vanessa will talk about that, and then I'll talk about the managed risk agreement. So uh, go ahead and go next, and I'll turn it over to Vanessa. Okay, so for the behavioral health and specialty rate concerns that have come up uh, recently, um, when a risk is identified during the concurrent reviews, uh, for an example, an ELF uh, behavioral health, um, a member leaving the ELF to consume um, alcohol or leaving and returning intoxicated, the case manager, coordinators and case managers will be notified to ensure a risk agreement is completed or on file. Um, we have received uh, SNF specialty rates, uh, just examples of a um, member in a SNF on a specialty rate, whether it's um, a service that they're getting for the specialty rate. Um, however, if the member is refusing to have that level of care um, on a daily basis, the CM coordinators and the tribal uh, case managers will be notified to ensure a managed risk agreement is completed or on file. Um, the prior authorization will not be approved until a managed risk agreement is completed. Um, and this is just because the members are in the setting um, for those specialty rates. Um, those rates are a higher rate, so we do want to be um, 
cost effective, but uh, also mindful that if you know the member um, does have something um, like this identified, that we do have a managed risk agreement on file or um, completed. Um, Fani, next slide. Okay, go ahead and go next slide. Okay, so the managed risk agreement uh, that is uh, covered in AMPM policy um, 1620L, and the link is provided there. Uh, this is a snapshot of what the managed risk agreement looks like. Um, the and this is a document that's developed by the case manager and the member healthcare decision maker on the provider when it has been indicated for a member that outlines potential risks to the member's health, safety, or well-being as a result of decisions made by the member or their healthcare decision maker regarding their long-term care services and supports. Um, <clears throat> The managed risk agreement um, shall specify the alternative uh, alternatives offered to the member and shall document the member's choices with regards to any decisions involving placement services, supports. Uh, the managed risk agreement uh, shall be signed by the member and or the healthcare decision maker um, at the PCSP meeting and kept in the member's case file. Next. So the uh, on the PCSP, if you have identified risks and you have MRA um, listed, then you should have a managed risk agreement in place. Uh, that separate document, and and uh, it should indicate um, uh, signed by the member, the healthcare decision maker. Uh, could be the provider and the case manager saying, this is what is going on. These are the risks we've identified. Your choices uh, are putting you at risk, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and it's to be, re be reviewed at each subsequent PCSP review and adjusted as applicable. Um, and if your tribal program does not have one, uh, managed risk agreement, you should, but if you do not, uh, please let us know and we'll be happy to send you a copy and it should be uh, tailored to each of your uh, tribal programs, um, but that should be in, that should definitely be in place. Go ahead and go next. And whenever there are behavioral health concerns or uh, a managed risk agreement, um, that on a PCSP with a member and a case manager submits a behavioral health or specialty rate PA request. Um, I know that Vanessa and uh, uh, Natalie went over this earlier, but that managed risk agreement must be attached along with the other required documentation. And this allows the clinical team to assess the risks and to determine if the specialty rate can be approved or if it needs to be escalated to the DFSM medical director for consideration. Again, this is, uh, it's very important because uh, they are reviewing these medical uh, records. They're reviewing a lot of things, their licenses on the line. They have to be very sure that this member is uh, truly um, understands their decisions, um, and uh, that they have um, have decided, you know, know that some of their decisions are putting them at risk and could possibly put them in major risk um, in any different way. We've seen some where they've gotten in um, a risk uh, with legal, and that is um, that is when um, it becomes pretty serious. So. Just please uh, be mindful that you are putting managed risk agreements into place when you identify risks that are um, putting that member at risk, okay? Uh, next. And that's all that we have for that. Um, any questions on that?
Okay. Um, excuse me, sorry. Oh, Sharon, go ahead. So with the risk management in place, will that, um, would that uh, lead to, um, what's it called? The, um, oh, what's it called? Oh, my mind went blank. <laughs> to, um, to the, you know, it says least restrictive environment. And then we have to fill out the, uh, where their rights are being restricted on the PCSP. <laughs> Well, it depends. Some of their choices could be putting them in a position where they are, uh, depending on this, you know, it's a case by case uh, basis. And uh, you know your members, you know the risks that they are going through. Um, what this does is the managed risk agreement lets everyone know that there are potential risks that are. Uh, could put the member's health at risk. In some cases, um, members are in a SNF and they are on a specialty rate and they, and they uh, decline those specialty services. That actually, we have to let them know that they are putting their own life at risk. Even it is their choice, but we do have to uh, put that into place. Um, members as as the uh, clinical team went over earlier, is maybe they're consuming alcohol and getting themselves into legal trouble. Um, that's putting them at risk, um, at major risk. Um, and are some of their rights being restricted? Possibly, depending on their choices. If they put that risk into place and those providers are actually uh, stepping up and saying, okay, we're going to make sure that this member is monitored when they go outside or whatever the case may be when they um, go to the store that they don't just wander off and get themselves into trouble um, so it is putting everybody on alert that including the provider that you could possibly be putting this member at risk you could or the member could um, this could uh it could be become a big issue and some of them we have seen some very serious issues come out of members choices um so hopefully that answers your question it's a case-by-case -case basis basically rachel was that janelle from to that asked that question or who was it that asked that question sharon no this is sharon, sharon from to oh sharon okay um, to answer that question, Janelle, and then to kind of piggyback off of what Sony had said, um, in a case where a member is um, um, having their rights restricted due to due to maybe to prevent them from danger to themselves or to others, um, you know, maybe they're wondering to, to use that example, maybe the member was leaving the facility and getting intoxicated, right? And they have a key to the door to the assistant living facility, they can come and go as they want to. And now they have to take the key away from that member because they're bringing home people that are <clears throat> bringing home friends that are drinking, and it's they're putting other people in danger. So yes, in that instance, you would have to complete the rights restricted to put it as an RR and also explain why the rights were being taken from the member. And it, in some cases, yes, you you would have to, right? You would have to to take the to take the rights from them. But it needs to be documented. It needs to be. Um, you need to justify why the rights are being restricted. From the member, you know, is or is it a danger to themselves or a danger to others? Uh, what is the reason why the rights are being taken from them? You know, or if they were not allowed to leave the room or not. There's been cases where members drink; they just they just continue to drink water, 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 and they're not. They're you know they're they're not medically they're not supposed to be drinking all of that water, but they're consuming it so much that it's causing a health issue to them. 
And so they have to monitor their intake or, you know, monitor and, and tell them you can't just go to the refrigerator anytime you want to. There could be health reasons why they cannot. But those reasons, if it's a medical reason or or if it's a danger to themselves or others, those need to be put on on it as if they're restricting the rights from the member and justify why they're doing that. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, yes. Well, I guess my next question would be like with every PCSP thereafter, uh, we would have to continuously put that in there or or just if it's in there one time, do we have to, yeah, do we have to keep putting it in there? there so, after any, so any time that you're, you put something on the PCSP, you're basically, you are identified an issue or a concern or a service that needs to be initiated, right? You're identifying it at that time. So you'll monitor it. And when it improves, you, it's slowly but surely you'll see in your, um, your next review, you're going to provide an update. Maybe you okay. might make it part of the goal. You may you put an update until it's no longer an issue. You know sure. what happened? What has caused you to um, um, improve that area for the member? How have you guided the member, or how have you or anyone that that is in the community helps the member? How were they all a part of that to improve it not happening again? So you'll see that eventually as you move on. You can see it in the case notes. You know, that's why documentation is really, really good. Once you identify it, we want you to follow it and make sure that you are addressing those issues of any rights that are being restricted. We don't want member to be, um, you know, not have access to the refrigerator if they don't have those those um, medical conditions anymore, or if, you know, maybe, you know, some issues that they've had before, cravings that they've had before, that's, you know, it's always gonna be there in the back of their mind, but they're getting treatment for it. They're, they're um, you know, getting pro uh, positive progress notes, you're reading the notes, that's no longer an issue. Yeah, that then you can just close it out and it's no longer, uh, their rights are no longer being restricted because they've improved. So so that's where we will put the, that EM, effectively managed? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, and Annie, you had a question in regards to the SNF. Go ahead and unmute yourself. I. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just want you to go back a couple slides where it, um, where you have that, if you could. I guess it's more right here. Okay. That is, um, Vanessa, I'll go ahead and let you go ahead and talk about that. Okay, so for like let's for with this example, there are multiple reasons why a member could have a specialty rate in a SNF. Um, the specialty rate in a SNF is for the higher level of care that the SNF is providing to the member. Um, so let's say maybe the member um, is getting inpatient dialysis, or maybe they're on. Uh, higher level of care in the facility, but they're refusing those services, the SNF gets a higher um, rate for the member being there daily. But if the specialty rate isn't being rendered for the time that the member's there because of refusals, um, then that kind of comes into question, you know, where the case manager would need to meet with the member to make sure that they are aware that that isn't um, a healthy decision, especially like let's say if they are on a higher rate for dialysis or maybe they um, are on um, a bariatric rate or a mem memory care rate, the provider does get a higher rate for those dates, but if they're not rendering the higher level of care, um, then the specialty rate does come into question. Um, but if the member is refusing and it is a risk to them, then a managed risk assessment does need to be completed so that um, it is on file, that they are aware it is a risk to them, um, as well as uh, just, you know, that the services for that specialty rate are continuing while they're in the SNFs. 
Did you have any other questions regarding that, Annie? No, I guess I just kind of read it a little bit um, different because it, you know, being refused by the um, member daily. And, and I have, a, you know, I have um, a couple of them, but I mean, he doesn't refuse his, you know, refuse anything. It's just that he gets mad and upset. So that would be totally different than what is written on here. So that was my concern. So we're good. Thank you for explaining. Okay. Are there any other questions? Free to go ahead. Yes, honey. Uh, thank you for allowing me to ask a question. Um, the question that I had is in addition to the visits for the reviews, is there any additional monitoring at these facilities like for the specialty rates? Sometimes they include like enhanced staffing ratios, things like that. Is there any monitoring in addition that's going on just beyond the just the regular review meetings that the case managers do? Thank you. Okay, I, I'm a little unsure. Are you talking about as far as uh, what we review on our side on the clinical team, uh, what they review, or are we talking about somebody else going in and, and monitoring? I think both. Uh, what's monitored on the back end as well as if there's any additional monitoring at these facilities to ensure that they're adhering to the requirements. Okay, Rachel has an answer for you. Just a moment, go ahead. Uh, we're running into this quite a bit on our end. As you know, there's that um, really big project that Access is on, on, on doing the on-site visit. They're auditing these providers to make sure that they're in compliance with what um, is part of their responsibility, especially if they have, if they're considering themselves a behavioral health residential facility. You know, there is um, uh, the uh, access DFSM team. There's a specialized team that are, is now doing on-site visit to ensure that it is, a, you know, if they're saying that they are a special behavior health residential facilities, that they are complying with what is required um, to run as a behavior health residential facility. As for a, a normal, just a regular SNF um, that is um, not the um, not providing behavioral health services. They are just follow, um, providing uh, uh, services to the members to provide supervision services, um, they're to meet the members' ADL services, or the daily living uh, personal care services, those type of services. There is really not the monitoring of the, at the provider level, but we do use those medical documentation that your case managers are submitting to request that specialty rate. That is when my team goes in and they see, okay, what level of care is this member at? Uh, according to the case manager's assessment, okay, they've assessed, they made eyes, they made contact, they sat there, they've seen, they've observed um, the member and from that assessment, they then determine this is the level that the member is at, this is the level of care the member is going to need. And then they would let the provider know there are no set rates for some of these providers, the health assistant living facilities. So they'll let the provider know, okay, this is the member's needs. This is what the member needs to have, you know, and then encompassing, you know, um, the cultural part of it and letting the provider know if I, you know, if I send my member there, I want to make sure that these needs are taken care of according to the assessment. So that that conversation should be happening. And even prior to admission of a facility, you know, there's word of mouth, you know, there's a Navajo Nation is a big tribe. So members, uh, case managers find different facilities that they can um, uh, use, use for these members. And in that, in that, meeting or at that time when you all are meeting together, who's a good provider? Who's that actually had eyes on the provider? Who actually went to see if this provider is rendering those types of services? 
tribal altics has always case managers have always been good about it if they see something that is strange or out of the ordinary um, most of the tribal long-term care health programs case managers or their supervisors would report back to access and say hey this this, it, this provider didn't seem right at all so then they would let us know uh, but we do look on the clinical piece we look at every single document that is submitted to us and we see if that's an uh, appropriate level of care and if we do see something that doesn't match the pcsp or the clinical notes that's provided by the case manager and then compare it to the actual notes that are provided the progress notes provided by the um, facility we're then going to ask questions what's going on with this or if we start to see that the member didn't have a legal case, a criminal case before, and now they have a criminal case, but yet this provider is getting a higher rate, who's watching that member? Those are questions that we'll be asking. So that's how we do the monitoring. It's really a partnership. And on the back end, um, Access is starting to do those on-site visits for anybody that is providing behavioral health services. So we will continue to do that. And that's when we notify you when somebody is terminated due to that on-site visit. So it, it takes everyone uh, to be part of that, um, you know, oversight of some of these providers. And Nyana, in regards to uh, facilities who don't provide the documentation timely to the case managers, uh, if you guys can notify us, uh, we can actually uh, reach out to them and let them know that they need to provide that that documentation, um, we can actually even, if they refuse to provide it, we can actually tell them that services cannot be PA'd if they do not provide this information. Um, usually we're successful in being able to reach them and once they hear it's from Access, they're usually pretty good about it. So please just uh, let us know if you're running into that situation. We'll be happy to step in and try to help. Any other questions? This is your time. So if you guys have questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Okay, well, we appreciate everyone who has uh, raised your voice. Uh, you're very important and all of you help to provide those services, vital services for our members. And we do appreciate you all. Oh, Frida, go ahead. Sony, thank you. Um, are we ever gonna return to in-person meetings for this quarterly tribal supervisors? I will, uh, I hope so. I would like for that to happen. Uh, Rachel, do you have any thoughts on that? I would love to do that. I think we posed that question a couple of quarterly meetings and there was really no feedback. Uh, what we like to do is, um, you know, go back to in-person. Um, typically, we um, would ask who would like to host it. You know, if there is no issues with uh, people coming down here um, every quarter and we can you know set up a room we can do that I guess we can um, maybe put in the chat who all would like to come back in person we really didn't get a response the last time we presented it at the at one of the quarterly meetings so I guess this is the perfect time where we can chat to say who would like to uh, do that in person again moving forward because we're open to it at any time Okay, Nyana says she would like it in person. Annie, Sonia, Frida. Anyone else? Claude, yeah. you don't want to host the, the quarterly meeting? What's going on, Claude? You're very quiet today. You might not have speakers. <laughs> Yeah, whoever wants to host it, if we want to do it, because that's how we used to do it, Frida, we would ask who wants to host it, and then 
we'll schedule it for the whole year, each quarter, um, whoever wanted to host it, or they'll let us, or someone will let us know, hey, you know what, I see there's a, a vacant slot, maybe we'll go ahead and host it, because I know on the tribal side, it does require planning. I know that uh, you all have to probably ask your leadership if you can host a training. So um, we can wait on that too. So we, we could probably send out a survey or an email that my team can send out and see who will be able to host if they want to. If we want to do in person and nobody wants to come forward and host it, that doesn't mean we can't have it in person. We can always, on those times that we don't have anybody volunteering, we can always um, put something together so to um, host it at the um, main office here in uh, Phoenix from at the access office. We can also do that too, but I'm, I'm willing to go back to in-person. I am actually too. I'm, I I do miss all of that, um, that in-person interaction. Very true. We've got some really good, uh, I, a lot of people are saying in person, they they really want that in person back. Okay. So, okay, well, we can definitely, for the next meeting, we will definitely discuss that. And if anyone has any idea of, uh, of whether you can host it, please um, let one of us know. We would love to be able to come out to your area, see your neck of the woods, get away from the heat. When is the next quarterly meeting? So maybe we can just put it out there. Um, if Can you check to see when the next quarterly meeting is? And maybe, I know it's not till three months from now too. So um, if anyone wants to host any of those meetings, forward moving forward maybe we can just send out an email and then just everyone respond to that one email to see when they will be able to uh which which quarterly meeting that they will be able to host we can do that oh, um, frida just said navajo nation can start it off provide possible date we're looking at um so frida is saying navajo nation will host the first one it looks like july 25th yes thank you awesome Thank you, Navajo Nation. We really appreciate that. And if anyone else has a, a, a um, inclination to host a meeting, please let us know and we can do that in the fall. Thank you very much. Well, Bronwyn, we appreciate your voice as well. Thank you. And Sonia, we appreciate you. Oh, PYT says that they will host in the fall. Okay, thank you. That's very nice. And uh, Native Health has space to host. Thank you very much. People will go ahead and um, get those um, in place. Thank you very much. Okay, this was great. This one's really great. Go ahead and go next. I think we're going to get done early, but okay. Um, so we are going to go ahead and announce the uh, springtime break icebreaker winners. We have three, and uh, we always try to not have the same people each time. Um, each you know each meeting, but we do appreciate everyone participating. So we have identified Christina Mini Mules um, from Native Health and Estella from Pasquayaki and uh, Niana Leonard from Navajo Nation. And thank you all for participating in that. We really do appreciate it. We hope that you enjoy it. Um, we try to make it as as uh, as applicable to the times uh, that we're trying, uh, you know, around the time frame of what we're doing and all. So thank you very, very much. We really do appreciate it. Okay, go ahead and go next. Oh. All right, we'll turn it over to Rachel to close out.
Thank you everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate it. We always have um, a lot to share during these quarterly meetings. And I just want to make sure that, you know, we all are understanding and knowing what challenges we come across. I know that you all, that the, your team members are actually doing all the hard work. I, I, a lot of kudos to them all the time because they're actually out on the field, they're on the road, they're traveling all the time in certain areas. It's really rough, to, you know, rugged areas that they have to travel, you know, and sometimes they, they're away from their family long periods of time. So it really does mean a lot to all of us uh, to know that we're discussing things to improve um, their, not only their process flows or workflows, but even as simple as um, updating uh, cheat sheets, or we've done a lot over the years. We've updated the ALF agreement cheat sheet, sheet uh, which was for years was a problem. And, um, you know, we've put, implemented that, put that in place. We even Im implemented the supervisory audit cheat sheet to help your case managers know when to um, put comments on the supervisory audit sheet. You know, we've done so many things, even on our auditing, we've, we've done some improvements on there. So that way it's easier to read and follow through along um, as you get your responses or when you're submitting your responses. And, you know, there's, there's never a time that we feel like we want to make things harder for you. We want to always try to work in collaboration and working, um, you know, with you all so that you, we all, if like I always say, if you fail, if you're deficient in some area, um, if, if it is related to policy or a process that we've had in place, then we're also deficient in our area. So we try to do the best that we can to uh, look at what we've seen within the past quarter when we're doing our presentation. What have we seen in the past quarter? What deficiencies have we seen in the past quarter? And um, what can we do to help them improve in those areas? Um, I know that some of you are all in here and you say, oh my gosh, we're gonna go through that again. You know, um, if we're seeing it across the board, we're gonna talk about it. Um, some of these questions related to um, behavioral health, those are some areas that we really do need to talk about. And even expressing like, you know, who monitors these providers? You know, why do they get these rates? You know, what should they be doing? Those are things that we really do need to talk about because it really does help us to say that we're hearing it, we're hearing you. And thanks to you all, I'm never going to stop saying this. Thanks to you all, your case managers, that we were not part of all of that stuff that went down with behavioral health. It was because your case managers were asking these questions. They were actually at the site. They were actually looking around. Does everything look okay? Is the member okay? Does the member feel like they're they're doing good? You know, are the members' needs being met? You know, are they is this provider culturally sensitive? Because that's that's the uniqueness of our program is that there is a lot of cultural, not only religious basis, but practices that we do or beliefs that we have or food, even as, as far as food is concerned, you know, they, once they're taken from home, they lose that. How do we find providers like that? How do we know providers are hearing and understanding when they're servicing our member? I just talked to a provider a couple of days ago and I said, these members are going to eventually go reintegrate back into the community. They're not going to stay at your facility forever. They want to go home. So what are you doing to help that member to reintegrate back into their own community? You know, you can't just um, buy them whatever they want when they have a behavior issue. You can't do that because that's not a way to deal with someone's behavior. You're really going to have to get someone in place that understands and knows how to work with these members. And I said, when you go back to the tribal community out here, these assistant living facilities, they take them to the movies, they take them to outings, they take them to uh, out to eat at buffet places or wherever, you know, they have all these activities that go along with their, um, you know, getting the services here, especially when their behavioral health. But when they go back to our communities, we all know that there's no around the corner pizza place. You know, it's they have to travel miles to get pizza you know, and um, there's no recreational facilities in every community. There's some of our members have to travel quite a long ways. So I always tell our um, providers, you know, 
do you even know which service area that you're providing services to? Because eventually I would like my members to move back to the community. So please, you know, make sure and, and ask these questions, educate your providers about it because your case managers are the ones that are actually on site doing these reviews, even in a skilled nursing facility, you know, is it time for the member to reintegrate back into the community? Are there resources out there? Is there something that the tribe does? I know one of the tribes, I know Pasquayaki does all, have a lot of resources for their, their members, not just the all text members, but uh, just members in general for their community. What resources are available in our community that we can provide to our members that our members can have access to so that when they come home, you know, um, they still have access to those services. So it, it's a lot, you know, and leadership, you all are a big part of that in planning that and making sure that our members are receiving those services. So it's always a pleasure to um, be working with you all and to provide that additional education, uh, you know, and also learning the policies. And I've mentioned that I, I would, I can't stop mentioning that because that it that really does play a big part in it and it really does help us to say are we in compliance and uh, you know your voices are being heard too at these quarterly meetings so don't ever feel like if i say this i'm going to get in trouble or if i say this i might say it the wrong way you know we all learn we've all learned and i i am a prime example of learning this program and really advocating from my cultural background my traditional background um, advocating for the program as a whole and, you know, utilizing that along with what I'm learning in policy. I'm more policy driven. Um, you know, I always look at the Arizona revised statute. I look at the federal guidelines and rules when there's a decision being made. You know, I always try to utilize those. And, and those decisions were made because our members deserve to have access to certain services too. Our members deserve the same care that an MCO member would have. And that's where we all fight to make sure that we that they do have access to those services. So I really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for um, being here. I know it's a lot, you know, it's it's, you know, a big chunk of your time in the morning, uh, but you all are dedicated to come here and we will continue to provide those updates and resources. A again, if there's ever any time you don't have to wait till a quarterly meeting. If you feel like, you know what, I seen that going through my supervisory audit report. I noticed that my, my team is struggling in this area. And if you're really true and honest with your audit and not just going through the folders and the file, and you're looking at this person as a whole person, and you identify that there's deficiency in any area, and you want to improve it before the, the next audit comes around, we're always here to help you all out. So just let Sony know her, her and her team can um, schedule something to do, um, a, you know, a a training for your team, either virtually or in person if you need it. If you feel like sometimes you need that in-person training, let us know so we can plan and get those trainings on, on the book so that they're able to provide those additional resources to you because that's what they're here for is to make sure that they're providing that additional um, assistance to you all. So thank you again. I know I always talk a lot because I feel like, you know, this is my passion and I know that it is all of you all's passion. So I really do appreciate everyone and just extend our thank yous to your case managers. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at, at Navajo Nation in July. So thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. And uh, access team, stay on.